firstly, um, a little bit about me. I'm a landscape architect and urban designer and horticulturalist. That's my sort of professional background uh, and have practiced as a consultant for many years. Uh, but in 2007, um, uh, a colleague of mine, John Hopkins, said I need some help on the Olympic Park. Uh, I thought it was a terrible idea at the time. I thought, oh, this is going to be none of those great British projects which goes wrong. It's uh, uh, you know, over budget and misses the deadline, etc. But um, anyway, somewhat reluctantly, I got involved and fantastic, extraordinary journey we've had since then. A little bit about the team which undertook the work, uh, particularly for the landscape and the parklands, everything outside the building, if you like. Um, myself and John, both landscape architects. Um, we've had lead landscape architects as master planners, LDA Design and Hargreaves working together for the games. Uh, James Corner Field Operations, well known for the High Line in the States, uh, working uh, in the south of the park in transformation post games, land use consultants. We also did something quite unusual in that we insisted, particularly on the run-up to games, that the engineering teams of Arup and Atkins were led by landscape architects. Uh, and certainly if you talk to uh, the landscape architects at Arup and Atkins, they will confirm that uh, engineers found this a very difficult thing to do uh, and really sort of wriggled and uh, et cetera to start off with, but found the benefits quite considerable because, of course, one of the things that landscape architects are very good at is looking at the big picture and the holistic view, if you like. The original master plan was by ACOM, uh, EDOR as they were, and that was led by a chap called Jason Pryor, who is a landscape architect as well. And then we had a number of specialists working with us. And I suppose the point I wanted to make about this and about the park as it is today, and it will be in the future, is that the key underpinning elements have been led by landscape architecture and landscape architects from the start. Um, I wanted to go back and actually look at the brief and what we said we would do uh, in 2007 when we really set out to design this place uh, and we had some really ambitious aims I think uh, in those days uh, we wanted to enhance biodiversity we wanted to promote culture build community cohesion uh, promote sports obviously provide connections and integrate infrastructure um, we wanted to turn this underdeveloped part of London and I don't know how many of you have been to the Olympic Park you, some of you have been there and uh, it's difficult to imagine what a state it was in in those days. Uh, it was a hole in London if you looked at, uh, I think it may, you may, may even have recognised it on the opening credits to EastEnders as this sort of blank bit in the city which nothing was happening in. So we wanted to make this uh, unique 21st century parkland uh, and we wanted it to be a new kind of park, breaking the mould, integrated into the city, uh, we wanted it to uh, respond to its challenging location as well. So our brief had all, w w was a large document, detailed document, setting out for our design team what we wanted them to do. Uh, and these are the sort of headlines, if you like. We wanted health and well-being to be up there. We wanted food production. Uh, we wanted uh, to think very much about biodiversity, water management, uh, um, energy generation, etc., etc. Um, perhaps in 2007, a list of the things which uh, nowadays will be seen as quite common in many respects, or at least recognised. Going on from that, one of the things which really drove the design of the park is something called the Biodiversity Action Plan. This was a result of all of the work through the environmental statement and the surveys, uh, original uh, uh, detailed analysis of the area, which uh, analysed what might be required in terms of ecology and biodiversity going forward in the future. It's a planning document, it's available online today, and it was really important, again, in setting out some of the constraints and some of the drivers for the design. What it, in simple terms, says is that by 2014, last year, half the parklands would be biodiverse in one form or another. Now, obviously, that had a big impact upon the design direction. Uh, because it said out of a park of about 100 hectares, 48 or so would be habitat, would be ecologically rich, would be biodiverse. So a very different slant on a park, on a green space, to many of the traditional green spaces you see, historic parks in London, like Victoria Park, for example, not far away from the Olympic Park. So that was a big driver. The other thing that we thought about right from the start was management, really important and something which we are 
not so good at necessarily in this country. What's the place like going forward in the future? How do we look after it? Especially a place which we know and today is very dynamic, a place which has events, which has massive uh, sporting venues, which will in the future uh, host football, rugby, um, concerts, you name it. Plus, of course, families visiting, people cycling, commuting through, you know, a place which is well used, deliberately so, and importantly so. So we thought about that. And right at the beginning at the Olympic Delivery Authority, we thought about legacy because, of course, the bid was won on the basis that it's all about legacy. It's all about what happens after the Games. The Games really being a big lever to deliver change in this part of London, which probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. In order to do that, we demonstrated how we'd achieve it through three master plans. How uh, we'd deliver the Olympics in 2012, how in 2014 we'd open up a public park, and then how in 2030 or there or thereabouts we'd have this fully built out legacy. New homes, new jobs, new opportunities for this part of London. Critical in delivering what we've called uh, alignment, which is bringing this part of London and the opportunities of this part of London up to the rest of London because uh, one of the sort of rather sad facts is that historically if you got on a central line in West London, say at Shepherd's Bush where Westfield is there, travelled east on the central line, as you carried on going east your life expectancy would gradually drop and that was a measurable fact because this part of London had poor opportunities, poor health, uh, poor unemployment, you name it. But we had a challenge. This is where we started out in 2007. This is a view looking towards Canary Wharf with the River Lee in the middle, the A12 here, Stratford International Station just over there, marooned in the middle of an empty site. Uh, the future Westfield always going to be there, being planned in that place there. And you can see, you know, a mixture of uh, uh, vegetation, underused um, employment, uh, um, dumping, you name it, all sorts of things happening. Waterways in an appalling state, um, you know, this is a fantastic uh, example of water not being used very well. Uh, in the middle of a city, uh, historic canals clogged with uh, rubbish and tyres, impassable by boat. And a place which people really wouldn't want to go into. Um, it was really an exclusive place uh, in the sense that uh, the only people who went there were probably going to do things which they shouldn't have been doing uh, or, 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 or otherwise. So we set out to decontaminate the site. We had to clean two million tonnes of material in order to do this, an enormous job. Uh, and we wanted, as part of our sustainability objective, to keep most of that on the site itself. So we actually cleaned the material. We had things called soil hospitals, which cleaned the soil, uh, moved it around. I think we had 13 different topographic models by the time we'd finished doing this uh, in order to start to decontaminate this place. And this is... Uh, uh, where the South Plaza is now, where the James Corner scheme is, and the orbit is probably actually just about here somewhere. So this was some sometime in uh, 2008, uh, seven and eight, something like that. Uh, and as part of our planning application for games, uh, we had to produce uh, CGI's showing what the place would look like during the games and afterwards. We had a very strict planning system to work through. It wasn't easy at all. We had to be, in many respects, whiter than white. And so we got our consultant team, Hargreaves LDA Design, to say, this is what the north of the park would look like during games. And you can tell it's games because we've got flags and people wandering around and, uh, and enjoying it. But we also had to say what it would look like after games. Uh, and it's really a sort of bit of a spot the difference thing because one of the key things we wanted to do was to demonstrate how we could build this place for this enormous sporting event but actually build it permanently so that it was there afterwards uh, as it is today. And it was quite interesting for me, I took an open house tour of the park earlier this year um, uh, and uh, looked over the bridge and saw canoeists in the river uh, and thought well, this is really spooky, it's actually like uh, the CGI had come to life, they'd been put there. But it's, it's testament, I think, to all the work that was done that, that, uh, that these things are happening today. In the north of the park particularly, uh, biodiversity, ecology, habitat are the big players, and it's the greener, quieter part of the park, if you like. Uh, and the design team came up with these diagrams to start off with to demonstrate the sort of layers that make up this very uh, multifunctional green infrastructure-led landscape talking about water systems. Water systems were a really important part of the landscape. We knew that 
uh, the climate is changing, we know that uh, rainfall is getting heavier, and we wanted to use this design opportunity to demonstrate sustainable urban design in action uh, uh, in this dense urban area. So we have systems of, uh, of bioswales, uh, of wetlands, uh, and, and frog ponds and other initiatives which help capture the water. Circulation was important, we wanted this to be, this to be the most accessible games ever. So um, part of that also was thinking about how you get people down into this landscape, how you get them through it. Um, Landform is fundamental in pulling back the landscape. We wanted the River Lee to be back in the centre of the landscape in this part of London. The River Lee is arguably London's second landscape, second most important river, but it had disappeared really from the landscape through over a century of industrialisation and uh, semi canalisation So pulling back the land, thinking about lawns and terraces for people to walk on, and then thinking about the sort of planting uh, and the habitats that would support that. And these are just some views of, the, of, it, of it being built. Uh, this very sculptural landscape, very legible landscape. It's quite interesting for me, actually. I take many people around the park, and many people think it's natural uh, now that it's uh, established and grown up. Of course, it's entirely man-made, like, uh, like this much of the British landscape. But very legible swales running down through the landscape, following the footpaths, swales capturing water from, from the hard paving and from the lawns and the plantings, etc cleaning the water, taking it down through frog ponds, etc., and other initiatives and into uh, the River Lee, uh, helping the River Lee clean up as well. And these are just some shots of us building it, uh, doing the massive earthworks necessary to create this part of the park. We planted over 300,000 wetland plants uh, on, on a pre-designed grid of, of uh, recycled uh, coconut fibre mats, um, and we were told by the experts that um, geese would descend uh, and eat them all before games. So um, we were also told that they don't like orange, so we cover them all in orange netting to keep the birds off, which seemed to work um, since they've grown very well subsequently and they're, they're still there. And some views actually just before games of, of the whole of that part of the park establishing. <coughs> One of the things which I think is a great story about this is about how the landscape works really hard for its uh, keep, if you like, it does more than one thing. It's not just about looking nice. Um, it works hard uh, and does a number of things. And this is a view of the Wetland Bowl in the North Park with the River Lee running through it. Originally, the river was much narrower and we opened it out, planted all these wetlands. The wetlands are there partly for habitat. They're a fantastic habitat. They've uh, brought in a wide range of species into, the, into this part of the river. Um, in fact, it was quite amazing when we were building it, uh, you could see birds coming in and having a nose around, a bit like people going and having a look at their new homes when they've just got been set out on the ground. Uh, very successful in terms of biodiversity, built fish channels etc to uh, shelter spawning fish and give opportunities for mammals and other others to live there. Of course it's also a fantastic place for people to go, they can get down by the river, there's no fences or anything to stop them uh, getting right close to it. On a summer's day, it's peaceful, it's wonderful. In this dense urban area, it's a real uh, fillip, if you like, to people's health and their well-being. Another key, one of our drivers. But the other thing it does is it floods. Uh, and last spring, or yes, last spring, it flooded nine times when we had all that wet weather. And it flooded deliberately so. It's designed to flood, the footpaths disappear, you can see the benches marooned, etc. Uh, and in doing so, it protects 5,000 properties upriver from, from, from flooding. So this is a really great example of a hard-working piece of landscape, which looks great, is enjoyed by many people, it's fantastic for biodiversity in this dense urban area, um, but also works in terms of climate change and water attenuation and flooding. So I think, you know, for me, I will show people these pictures and say this is good value. It's better value than attenuation tanks and big pipes and all the infrastructure which you know you would have to do or may have done historically to deal with some of these things. One of the big things we did in the park for games which uh, I think people really enjoyed was uh, perennial meadows. We wanted to use meadows as a way to demonstrate how you could uh, create biodiversity on a very large scale. Um, but of course we were very risk averse at the ODA. We couldn't get it wrong. We had to trial it and test it. Uh, and uh, so on the park, before we built it, we were trialling and setting out beds to test perennial meadows. 
and see how they would work. So uh, that's uh, the start and that's uh, sort of 18 months later when they've come into flower and they're growing well. We wanted to do it not just to make sure that it would actually work because we were about to sow the largest perennial meadow ever attempted in the world, um, but also to see if we could force it to flower during games, which would be later than it would normally flower. So we tried starving it of water, cutting it at various times, etc., etc., and managed to sort of play God briefly anyway. Um, still there on the park uh, and uh, looks fantastic. Again, um, a, a really uh, amazing uh, asset in the centre of London today. In the south of the park, and this is a view during construction, um, we did some uh, other initiatives in terms of landscape to really make a splash. The big one was around the stadium where any of those people who saw it on television or went to games would have seen this amazing annual planting which wrapped around the whole stadium. And again, we wanted to make a point here about how uh, this type of landscape is fantastic for biodiversity, uh, but also, again, it's a great thing for people. This is an urban site. Uh, it's a park in the middle of London. It's a place for people to come as well. We did it for games. Um, we can't do it any longer. It's a very expensive thing to do on this sort of scale. But the other thing we did do, which is still there in the park, in the south of the park, opposite the aquatic centre, is something called the London 2012 Gardens, where we set out to tell a bit of a story about the British habit of going around the world and collecting plants uh, for, for many centuries, from the Mediterranean all the way through to temperate Asia. So we worked with some uh, amazing planting designers uh, from Sheffield University, James Hitchmau and Nigel Dunnett, a great garden designer called Sarah Price, um, and some amazing nurseries to put this together. And uh, these are just some shots during the games, but pretty much looks the same today. An amazing blaze of colour. A demonstration, most importantly also, of how non-native plants can be valuable for biodiversity. It's heaving with insects, uh, uh, in the summer, great for nectar feeding, uh, insects, bees, moths, uh, all sorts of things uh, make great use of it. So 2005, six, something like that, and then this is where we were just before games. So an enormous transformation in an incredibly short period of time. And I should say, when this was being built for games, at its busiest, the site had 12,000 people working on it. So it was an enormous exercise, bridges, utilities, venues, and of course the park itself. So of course in games, uh, fantastic. I think uh, despite all the cynicism, after Danny Boyle's opening ceremony, people suddenly realized that something special was happening here. And when people came to the park, which they weren't expecting, they fell in love with it. And I was lucky enough to walk around the park uh, on a daily basis, and I just turned around and took that picture. Uh, and people uh, just fell in love with this amazing green space, which, uh, which was a surprise to them. I think, coming to this place. But it worked really well. Uh, it was a spectacular place to visit, um, still is, great for people, still is. Thronged with people watching sport and activities uh, and enjoying the sort of buzz of the place, but also enjoying the planting that we'd done. Uh, so much so, in fact, that we actually had to cordon off areas so that people could put their kids in and take photographs of them um, because uh, they were so enamored by it and just a few shots of the sort of colour and textures. A very British response, if you like, to this event, very much about parks and gardens. 2014, or well, we closed the park in 2012. We had two years to transform it. Lots of people were quite upset that we closed it because by that time, you know, they knew there was something great there. But we had to, we had to take down temporary venues. We had to take out temporary bridges. We actually doubled the size of the green space uh, in those two years between uh, 2012 and 2014, um, creating areas up here where, for example, there'd been back of house and temporary venues during games. So we, we, we did an enormous amount of new landscape work. But two things I wanted to talk about in particular, which I think really make the place work. In the north and the south, we had to build things which weren't there for games, play areas, cafes and restaurants, places for people to meet, go to the loo, etc. In the north of the park, uh, we built a a, a, a cafe, a restaurant, which is called Timber Lodge now, with a new play area called Tumbling Bay. Working with some consultants called Land Use Consultants, um, they came up with a great idea, which is about natural play, a place for kids to play, to get dirty, to experience nature a bit, which we think is really important in the city. It's something that many children don't get the opportunity to get their hands dirty, if you like. 
So we wanted a place where, uh, where, where kids could uh, engage with nature a bit, but also a place where they could take risks. It's well recognised that play for many decades now in this country has been too safe. Kids have got bored with a swing uh, and a merry-go-round and a bit of soft paving and a, a bouncy chicken or whatever they have in many play areas. And we wanted to make a place which they could really uh, experiment in. We, we know this is important for their mental well-being. So we built this uh, incredible play area which has been so successful where kids can get wet, they can dam water. We have a wet play area where they can play with uh, the um, a sort of analogy of the River Lee and they can pump uh, using these pumps and do all sorts of things like that. Um, and we have an amazing climbing area where kids can really take risks. In fact, uh, when I'd completed building it uh, and I took my park operations team up, it was quite funny. It was a bit like taking your car to the garage and saying, well, what can you do with this? Because lots of men, grey hair like me in suits, stood around with their arms folded and went, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let my children near that. Um, but it's turned out to be one of the most successful play areas in London now. Um, heaving with people, climbing in it, uh, uh, swinging, um, getting wet, exploring, um, doing all sorts of things. Um, and the great thing about it is it hasn't got a fence around it. We haven't got any signs saying little kids here, big kids there. And the amazing thing you find out about children is actually they do have brains and they can work out risk and they can analyse opportunities and things and, and they just do it. Uh, and we haven't had any accidents, uh, even though you know the worst was predicted. Um, so that was, that was good fun work very well. In the south of the park, um, this is a shot looking out with the aquatic centre, water polo now gone and of course the stadium and the orbit. This area in pink during games was hard paved in order to get the sheer number of people through the park from Westfield over here across this bridge and to all the various venues. It was going to stay hard paved but we took a view around 2013, 2011, 2012, 2013 that it would be a bleak place to be on a cold winter's morning. So we came up with a brief uh, for a competition to design a sort of 21st century pleasure garden, taking some cues from Tivoli, for example, and places like that. Um, the winning scheme, this is a diagram from the winning competition entry, was by James Corner Field Operations from the States, well known for the High Line in particular. Um, they had this very simple idea for a promenade, orientating people when they came across from Aquatics and Westfield with views to the stadium and a hub building and then this squiggly line representing a series of different spaces and they had these wonderful visuals uh, which were very seductive and certainly did the job for us in terms of saying what this sort of place could be like in the future. Um, oh, I always put this in because I love this, it's a beautiful drawing, it's by our planting designer who worked with them, a chap called Pete Udolf who is probably one of the most respected planting designers in the world. But it's craftsmanship, this is how to do it properly and uh, one day I'm going to ask him for the original so I can put it on my wall but um, uh, it, it's a be beautiful drawing. A few days before opening um, we've taken this place to bits and created this series of spaces and rooms uh, and places to play um, look fantastic uh, and just on, on, on opening day in fact. And the great thing about it for me, this is about play in this, in, in this broader sense, it's a place for everybody to occupy place for adults, it's a place for children, a place for people of, you know, who are visiting, locals, etc. So he designed these amazing seats uh, which are occupied by people picnicking, by people having little mini meetings, uh, playing chess, you name it, I've seen everything happening almost on those. Um, incidental play which is great for kids, although I've seen adults on these as well. We built them very strongly because again it's just part of the landscape, it's something that for people to, to, to get involved with. And, and of course water which people absolutely love. Um, one of the nice stories about this, it's so popular in the summer, it's just heaving with people getting wet and running through it and having screaming fits, is that we couldn't work out why the Dyson hand dryers in the uh, cafe were continually breaking down. It was because parents were taking their kids under underclothes in there and trying to dry them out after they got soaked on a summer's day. Um, so any unintended consequences of people having fun. Uh, so just some images there. Uh, and you know just people being able to play and take quite risky do quite risky things in this amazing colorful beautiful environment which is you know a stimulating place place for all so going forward um, into legacy uh, into the future um, most importantly we have a vision for legacy um, but now this is really happening fast and in fact 
I think one of the great things about uh, what we've done is it's given people confidence, so much so that actually things are changing and things are happening which weren't expected in the first place. So for example, this part of the South Park was originally going to be high density housing. UCL are now building their first campus outside of central London here, which is going to be, bring a real change to the area. Similarly, up here where water polo used to be, again, it was probably going to be high density housing. Now it's going to be something with a mouth crunching name of Olympicopolis, um, but basically the Victoria and Albert Museum, Sadler's Wells, University of the Arts London, and indeed the Smithsonian are now coming to that part of the site. So this is going to uh, we're now going to have you know, this fantastic opportunity here to really change this part of London uh, in, in a way which is, you know, if anything, even more uh, extraordinary than was originally anticipated. So a few quick slides of stuff coming up. I won't linger on them, but um, basically things are moving fast with new homes, new schools, uh, new opportunities for employment. Uh, for example, uh, TfL are moving to uh, the site as well. Their new headquarters is going to be there. New schools, universities, um, UCL, um, a whole load of a whole load of stuff, jobs um, here east, seven, seven and a half thousand jobs up at the top of the site, um, and, and and stuff happening in the future. So, really, um, I think uh, what this demonstrates is that is that the Olympics and the promise that we made in 20, 2005 is coming true with even greater speed than was ever expected. And I'd like to hope that a lot of that was because of the park which sits in the centre, which gives people confidence about the quality of the environment that they're going to be living in, working in, etc. Um, I think uh, Peter Neal, who's a, a well-known landscape architect, uh, ex-CABE commissioner, etc., um, made this point that uh, it's a great demonstration of how landscape architecture can lead at all levels. Uh, this park is now recognised as being globally significant uh, in terms of how it demonstrates uh, 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 regeneration, parklands in the future. And, and I just put a few shots in at the end actually just to sort of say, you know, fantastic people climbing, uh, 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 extraordinary art interventions. Um, you know, I love this shot because it's just people going bonkers and getting wet uh, and enjoying these open spaces. Um, uh, fantastic places, uh, River League cleaned up, boating happening, um, events. Um, colour and texture um, in abundance, a sort of wonderful Northlands, North Path the Park, great place for biodiversity uh, and great fun for me. Uh, and, and as a client actually I put this in because I think it demonstrates some of the things I, I've been involved in which is, you know, we wanted to have this amazing lighting display in the south of the park, it works really well. But it took a long time to get there, we had to go through several different iterations, we had mock-ups built, we had some amazing people uh, working in Sheffield on making these. I still don't know how you make a one metre galvanised steel ball but um, and then cut holes in it and try out different light sources etc. But I suppose it demonstrates that um, for me that landscape architecture is about all of these sorts of things and many more in this sort of, uh, in, in this sort of project and many others. It's about leadership, flooding, ecology, detailed design, sewers. You know, it's amazing the things that you find out about when you do this sort of thing. Um, uh, working with the public um, uh, and all sorts of other stuff as well. Thank you for coming.